All right, Steve, thanks a bunch. We're going to get started because we've got the, uh, we got 45 minutes and I'm uh, 50, 50, now 50, maybe 55, 55, 57. 50 with questions. Okay, and then lunch. So if you're interested in the topic, you'd stay and, uh, before lunch. But So how many people saw this presentation last year at AppSec USA or at AppSec EU? So besides Dan Cornell and, and Greg Reaver that we know real well, uh, Okay, so, so a few of you have, but this is a, a second version of that and focus on a couple of areas. And for those that don't know me, uh, application security enthusiasts have been, I think, at 10 of these. Uh, Ex-Air Force person, unlike Dan Cornell, our, uh, the person who spoke before us, uh, I'm more from the, the, the uh, network security side, an InfoSec guy. I uh, was one of the early stage AFCERT people in the mid-90s, back when uh, all IDS was manual. Kind of, those were the fun days. Uh, and, uh, and have become uh, one of the principals at Denim Group, a serial, serial entrepreneur, MBA type business guy, and then obviously uh, for those that haven't heard, I'm a dad now, so we get to balance all those. Uh, when I'm not at conferences, when I'm not thinking, uh, you know, focused on the work at hand, <clears throat> I'm typically snake hunting in South Texas. So the irony is, a true story here, uh, my mother-in-law owns a ranch south of San Antonio, and a uh, huge, uh, for those that don't know, big drought in Texas, huge rattlesnake problem. So I get the phone call. I'm like on a conference call with the client. I get the, hey, can you come down after work and help do a snake hunt? And I was like, I had to do a pivot off of like SQL injections and, 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 and solving massive software security problems to like, okay, I gotta go find snakes with, with the ranch hands. Which by the way, I'm, I'm particularly gifted at for those that don't know. And, and for those who have never snake hunted in South Texas or any place, there, there are a few essentials that you, you must have to be successful. Uh, for those that are wondering, so, so obviously, if, uh, I, I took this picture a long time ago, there's an AppSec uh, EU 2011 t-shirt. All my AppSec t-shirts have somehow migrated down to this farm. All the Bender t-shirts for the apologies in advance. Uh, have to have one of those, have to have a cool hat, it's really hot down there. In my case, a cooler hat. Uh, you know, it's also important to have snake guards. For those who don't know, snake guards are like shin guards so that the, the rattlesnakes don't bite your ankles or that's where they strike. That's, you can get them at sports goods stores in Texas. Very, very handy. Um, but in addition to like that tactical equipment, um, you know, like cool common gardening tools, a hoe, maybe a, you know, those, those things work out really, they're just apparently further than the snake strike. I didn't, I didn't know that. Uh, but, but for those that are particularly advanced, maybe a machete or two, uh, you know, so we're not really catching snakes per se. We're, we're uh, most importantly putting snakes into snake heaven, I guess. And I'd say by far the most important thing is having a guy that actually knows how to catch snakes on the team. And uh, <clears throat> my story here is all the guys, of course, in South Texas, none of them speak English. And I'm out there searching for snakes with them. And I don't know what the word snake hole is. I don't, I'm trying to think of all the words. Look behind you. What is that in Spanish? So like, Luckily, none of us got bit. I'm here today and uh, off and running. So that's what I do in addition to uh, helping with Dan and, and one other partner run Denim Group. But we're going to launch right into the stuff today, what you're here for. And this is the, the second version of this study that we started last year. We did another study this, uh, this year around how to quantify training, AppSec training, the impact of training, what people are being trained on, because the going in premise here is that training is typically part of any application security program, yet all the vendors, most of the internal program managers are ill-equipped to provide numbers, provide impact ROI. If you go to a CFO and the CFO asks, well, what's, if I do this, what do I get out of it? I mean, you typically don't have a great response. So that's the starting point for this. We go through, we talk about the key results, some of the stuff we found last year, but mostly the meat of this year's survey. So what did we find out last year? That you know, development is hard. Application development is hard. Uh, you know, application training and security round is also very hard. This is, these are hard topics uh, that are that are rarely measured. We we suspected that, and then the ROI component. Uh, we learned that ROI is rarely captured on HR training, and particularly in this space. So even though there's training dollars for PCI, training dollars for compliance, there's rarely somebody that comes behind to try to measure the improvement. Rarely, uh, and outside the most sophisticated. And, and, but, but the reality of it is, we don't know what good enough is. It, it, you know, the utter absence of training is terribly bad. So we know that training, you're not gonna, you're not gonna test your way into the end zone. You can't just finish, you know, fix the SDLC. You're gonna have to have training, but how much is that? Is that 20% of your budget, 10%? We simply do not know. What we learned last year, we, we surveyed about 600 folks. We were able to use about 450 
of those uh, respondents, we found out that there was a 25% retention before and after training. We were able to capture about 100 developers who had had either classroom training or right in the middle of an e-learning rollout and do a greenfield before and a after class. So that was about a 25% bump. Uh, we also found out that it jumped out at us as, a, as not a hypothesis, but that the QA uh, respondents, people who identified themselves as quality assurance testers who were in the AppSec world did profoundly worse than everybody else. That, 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 that held true again this year. And then also this issue about how developers may be able to get the answers correct about awareness uh, issues, but not uh, how to protect uh, the code itself. Uh, kind of intangibles that we learned, we learned that software development, uh, uh, like, like typically companies will teach differently. They'll, they'll, they'll teach in structured and formalized ways, but maybe developers aren't learning that way anymore. Uh, we were humbled in our first study because out of those 600, we had 450 that didn't complete the surveys. It was befuddling. What we found out that as soon as we added Amazon gift cards, everything after that, they were all filled out. So incentives, you know, human nature's at play here. Incentives do matter in some component. That was an unintended uh, outcome that we had for last year's study. We tried to put that to work this year. And then conducting surveys are hard. There's a reason that Gardner IDC 451 group in the analyst community exists because doing this out of hide as a vendor who is out there running a business too, that's, it's really hard. And what we found is that even, uh, well, it's kind of been a political litmus test. Some of our uh, folks that said, oh, I'd love to have my company do this back in June, simply could not muster the internal support to get their developers to take 15 minutes out of their schedules to conduct this, to, to take this test. That's interesting. Uh, again, we learn things more about the processes and about where we live in, in the corporate world as a result of that. That was last year. So this year, we started the survey earlier this summer. We were able to uh, talk to about 600 respondents and use about 500 uh, of those because, again, people do silly things. They don't fill it out or they get a, a tough question uh, and they don't answer it, uh, representing a broad swath of industries. We asked the same 10 application security questions that we asked last year. We'll give you examples of those. The same ones, we wanted to compare apples to apples there. But we added five additional questions about how developers learn and what they felt was effective. That's some of the net new stuff for this year. We were unable to do a before and, able, and after analysis. I mentioned we had probably about 100 respondents last year that gave us their full contact data and said, contact us next year for, uh, to see how we did a year later. Of those, uh, roughly 112 responded. That's, that's abysmal. Uh, so we threw out those results and really can't uh, say too much about that. So that's disappointing. We thought we could catch them a year later and see what they did. Uh, we're gonna try to uh, take another run at that next year. We, didn't, we also didn't have any training, uh, in, uh, classroom training opportunities. As a vendor, we, we, like many vendors, we do classroom training. The interesting thing about classroom training is you get kind of the, the feedback uh, in person. You get anecdotal stuff, which, which for those in the, the research business, there's two anecdotes equal data. So anecdotes you can't dismiss, that's important, that's context. Uh, but we didn't have that this year, so it was all purely off of surveys. Uh, and then finally, we use a little bit more social media, and we, can, we've, we by popular demand, have kept the data collection process going. So keep that in the back of your head if you're interested in this stuff. We need more anonymized data. But in spite of that, we got some, really, some real good zingers this year. So uh, for those that don't remember don't, or weren't here last year, we, we divided our, those 10 AppSec questions into two categories. Broadly, awareness questions, are you aware of key AppSec concepts like these? And then what we considered uh, more the uh, defensive coding or security, you know, how would you implement or what are the prescriptive sides? Um, so we divided those roughly, I think we had uh, six uh, this year, or four uh, roughly in there, but, but basically we, we split those because we wanted to see the responses and they were different. And that's a key point to take away. We, uh, delivery means we sent you know, to companies, we used SurveyMonkey, social media, pay, some paid social media. We got it out there. Uh, we were driving data collection throughout the summer. Again, very humbling. And, uh, and, and again, I appreciate why our analyst groups get paid a lot of money to do this because it, it ain't easy. But we targeted software developers. We targeted people who self-identified as architects or quality assurance uh, staff. We didn't target information security professionals. We didn't target project managers, BAs. Uh, really trying to, uh, to, to, to measure the efficacy of training and or how they're learning. So we cared less about the peripheral folks. 
We asked some demographic questions, again, kind of what your job function is, company size, years in the, in the, in the world of uh, development, and, and a little bit about what they've done in the past. So we'll start to share those with you now. Some things jumped out, and I'll point a few things to you. So right off the bat, you know, how many years of uh, development experience? About a third had over 12 years. That's, that's a, a very senior group. About a third, a little bit less than a third, had between one and two years. That's, that's not unusual, and the rest fell in between. So a, a broad cross-section of senior, mid-level, and uh, junior developers. About half identify themselves as software developers. And then a smaller swath uh, as QA folks and as architects. Uh, luckily, the numbers were high enough in those categories where we, we have meaningful results. And they also tracked very closely to last year's uh, query. So, so that even though they're smaller, uh, that's better. As, as far as the others, which was a ton, we actually, for the first time, had about 40 or so people identify as, so had some word of security in their, in their title. Secure development manager, security developer, uh, you know, security architect, application security architect. So they didn't self-identify as developers, architects, or QA folks. So that was very interesting. So some of those are baked in uh, the other, and we pulled them out to do some subsequent analysis, and I'll talk about that in a sec. Uh, company size, so about a, a little bit over a third were from enterprise clients above you know, 10,000 or so, big environments, and then all over the place. So we didn't want to focus on SMB you know, uh, or, or enterprise. And honestly, we were kind of slaves to whoever responded. There's a certain point in July or August where I was like, I don't care you know, if they're, <laughs> yeah, let's get them in, let's get them in, we needed the numbers. So there is sample bias, and, and for the record, you know, we're not going to quit our day job. I'm not going to quit my day job and go work for a polling company for the next presidential election. Uh, the, the, the other interesting part about this, and I, I really focused on it last year, the starting point for academic rigor, there was pretty much non-existent before this. And, and, uh, and I'll talk about it a little bit later. Uh, our colleagues at Aspect are doing similar studies. Before what we did and what they did, there was virtually nothing out there. So the starting point for analysis is, is baseline is zero. Okay, let's get into some of the uh, interesting uh, things. That, again, uh, results. The tract, these track very similar from last year. Uh, about a third said they had no application security training at all. About a third going in. And about 31% said they had somewhere between a day or two days. Now, a quarter had more than three days. That's, a, that's a substantial. So more, the people that said, hey, I in somewhere in my career had more than three days. Now, unfortunately, we couldn't ask, or didn't ask, I should say, <clears throat> was that three days of training a month ago? Was it two years ago or 10 years ago? So that's an area for future analysis, is how long ago was that training? Because obviously retention uh, comes in. But, but again, a good chunk of none, some, and a lot. I mean, three days is a lot, to be candid. So here's the big thing that jumped out at us this year. <clears throat> and these are numbers you can take out, and we're going to include as probably the lead uh, uh, takeaway for this particular uh, survey. 56% of the software developers, uh, excuse me, software developers answered 56% of the questions correctly. That number is shockingly close to last year's study of 58%. And uh, for those that saw Aspect, uh, they released a study earlier in the week that lines up almost uh, cl very closely with this. Those numbers are at over, I think, 2,000 developers, 2,200 between the two, the two companies and three uh, uh, surveys. That number is pretty darn close. To, so you can say now that if somebody asks you what is the starting point for knowledge, it's somewhere between 56 and 60 percent. That is, that is a number you can take home. And, and I was, when I saw that number come out and when I saw, you know, saw the, 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 the aspect study, I was like, oh my gosh, those numbers are not, are, are remarkably close. So, so 56 to 60% is a, is a number that you can start to use and use in a, in a, uh, in a, very, in a more public way. Here's another thing. We, I, I told you we asked five additional questions about how people were learning and what they were doing process-wise, not just app set questions and technical questions. So we asked, you know, how, how many of you how many of your organizations implemented some type of SDLC or a pro process improvement related to security after your training? What percentage? About a third, 33% said, oh yeah, we did. About 25% said, no, we did not. But perhaps more astonishingly, about 42% said they did not know. So 
there's a bunch to take away from this. I'll get to that and the conclusions. But 42% uh, didn't know. The vast majority had no or didn't know. That, that is, we have our work to do. We have our work cut out for us. So the other thing we asked was that the types of training. We, we, this is what we wanted to find out from last year. Because the vast majority of training that's delivered by big companies is e-learning and a classroom training because it scales well. It's repeatable. It's measurable. PCI QSA guys like it. You know, it, it works, right? It's, it, we know how to do it. But what we found out uh, that, you know, in spite of all the cool things that are out there, crowdsourcing sites, RSS feeds, social learning, there's a thing called social learning platforms now where you can collaborate and ch trade stories if you're a developer. But here's the key takeaway is that e-learning and instructor-led instructor training, they're both the, still the primary way that, that developers learn in large enterprises. So huge deal there. And we're going to talk about why that's important. I'm going to spend a little bit more time on this slide. It's a busy slide. And for Greg and crew in the back, I apologize. This is a reading test. Uh, we'll share the deck later. Uh, but what we asked them is what they felt was effective. OK, so you've been through this. You've been through e-learning. You've been through classroom training. You've done all these things. You've cited these different things. What did you think was effective? So instructor-led presentations or training were very effective. Uh, the, the vast majority were e-learning or instructor-led training, and the, the perceived effectiveness of instructor-led training was, uh, was the highest. If you go up to the second one, one-on-one -on -one coaching was also viewed uh, as very, very effective. What are the two things that scale the worst for those that have rolled out a training program? One-on-one -on -one coaching and classroom training. So the challenge that we have is like, how do you take those numbers? And here's, oh, by the way, here's all these other things they do. They do use RSS feeds. They do use, you know, uh, you know, comment on the heart bleed story. What happened to Target? How can I apply it to us? I mean, there's a lot of other ways that a social learning things that, that, that are simply not being used. Part of that reason is, is because that's how big companies roll out training programs. And by the way, most of them are still compliance driven. And I will tell you a story. Uh, and, uh, and again, the friends uh, in the industry that do the same, similar uh, e-learning know this, that the vast majority of e-learning is sold for compliance purposes. Uh, and what I mean by that is if absent of, of, of the PCI DSS, uh, there would be a lot less of this. And uh, anecdotally, we've had uh, four or five clients who you know, stood up a big e-learning e uh, instance with us. We hosted it. Uh, QSAs were coming in two weeks, got, you know, showed the QSA that, never logged in. Uh, so we've had a wealth transfer from certain companies to Denim Group for uh, about a quarter of a million dollars over the last several years of e-learning bought but never consumed. And if you go and talk to our friends at Aspect, at SI, and at Sigital, I suspect they have similar stories. So the point is, is that it's great. It's, e learning is a great compliance checkbox. Uh, it is used widely, but just used by itself, that, that, that may not be a best practice. Okay, I mentioned this from last year's study. The numbers line up for this year with a separate group of respondents. But again, uh, developers were able to get uh, the awareness questions right. You know, again, 70% more or less is the passing rate. They didn't pass, but they, got them, uh, they were less worse on the awareness questions. Uh, the prescriptive questions, they, they did uh, particularly poorly. Uh, QA guys, QA folks, bombed it again. And uh, there's challenges with that. that. These numbers, again, I, when I got them, I, was, I felt like a kid Christmas morning. Like, oh my gosh, they're, they're, they're not orders of magnitude off from last year. They line up with last year. So QA folks uh, uh, did not do well. So here's another one. So training does matter. I mean, like, so people that said they had three days or more of training did twice as well as people who had no training, roughly. However, they still missed it. I mean, that's, that's, uh, they still did not hit the 70% passing rate. They were close to 65. That's, 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 so that's, that's not great. And then here is an interesting one, though. We did go and target a handful of companies that identified themselves as security companies and the development people in security companies, including Denim Group. And they, they did pass. That 80% is above the 70% and in, in incredibly worth. That the numbers in that, the respondents were about 60 to 70, so material. But the point is, 
if you are in a company or an environment that values security, that reinforces it, that has training and maybe actually does this part of the build, there is some, there is hope. You, I mean, that, 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 that we're going to spend more time on this next year, but that is very interesting. So companies, individuals that self-selected as working for security companies are said, hey, I'm a secure developer, secure architect, somewhere in that. Those people that were in the other, there was a lots of them. That's where we pulled that out and did second level analysis. This is an area for future uh, analysis and future uh, questions, but a, 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 a broad slimmer of hope. So what, what can we really, really draw from this? And, 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 and this is great data, and there's a lot here, there's a lot to absorb, and I want to I wanna leave a lot of questions, uh, time for questions and answers at that, because there's a lot of data in this, and this is candidly the tip of the iceberg. So one thing that I, I was able to pull off of this right off the bat, you know, this is basic training or education 101. Uh, we know anecdotally in most in, uh, enterprise environments, most clients, that AppSec training is an A, let me characterize it as an A, periodic uh, activity. It doesn't happen frequently or consistently. And uh, for those that do open SAM assessments or software assurance maturity model assessments, you could, this is one of the questions you can ask. How frequently and how measurable is your training effort? Because people who had identified as having three plus days of training still did not have a passing grade. They're right below that at 65. But these are the people that should be the best. They still didn't pass. Now again, uh, that, that begs other questions. It was likely, were those the same people that were, went into environments that didn't have SDLC changes? Was it a one-off training? How long ago was it? This, this opens a Pandora's box of potential other questions to ask. And one that is, is, is you know, like if, if a company, if you go to a CFO and say, I'm gonna pull all our developers off the line and do three days worth of classroom training, which everybody knows and recognizes as being very effective, and oh, by the, by the way, we have 1,000 developers. That is a substantial cost and a substantial amount of disruption. If I do that and they still don't pass two or three la years later, I'm going to question the efficacy of doing that. And maybe there's another way to, to, to address that risk. Uh, so uh, that is a big deal. Uh, the SDLC uh, component of it uh, may have a huge impact. And, and isolating the impact of one versus the other is, is particularly difficult to do. Um, so uh, this is a statement of the obvious, and I think I, you may you could argue that I didn't need to do the uh, survey and collect data to come to this conclusion, but we we verified that that training without SDLC uh, changes will likely produce the same results. Uh, you know, 67% either answered no or that they don't know if changes were made. So if you go and and, and if it's instructor-led training, you get a couple days off. You know, training is a feel-good activity. Hey, you know, you go to a, a class for a couple days, kind of goof off activity, uh, and then you come back and there's no, like, okay, there's no handoff or no changes and process changes. Uh, the likelihood is developers are going to revert to their, their old ways. Uh, and they're not held accountable for it, uh, and they're not measured for it. So it's, it's common, and training's great, but in isolation, will produce miserable results without reinforcement and without process changes. So I think that is a valid, uh, thing that we've, that's jumped out at us. Again, for those who have parked QA, or excuse me, uh, parked AppSec in QA, you have to rethink how you do that. So they have consistently and substantially done uh, less well than developers at large and architects. So if, you, if, if the standard practice, and it is with a lot of organizations, that you park your junior developers in QA to kind of learn stuff and do testing, then you, oh, by the way, you put AppSec testing in that same QA group, uh, you are not going to get anything but, but, but poor results. And so this is an area for additional thought and additional, uh, you know, an, uh, really analysis around what, what, what do you do? If, you, if that's where it lives, and it does for a large chunk of the organization, how do you expect them to do sophisticated business logic testing, sophisticated auth testing, you know, validation of scanner results if they simply are just learning how to code. So that, that is a little bit of that we learned last year from Anecdote. And, and, and again, Denim Group has about 70 software developers. So we, we know, you know, where they, where, where they live too. So we, we've picked this up and it's something that bears further analysis going forward. Incentives matter. They absolutely matter. They mattered last year when we gathered this stuff, the information. They matter again this year. 
Uh, and uh, you know, I think when we picked this up when we've interviewed AppSec managers as part of uh, the collection of data, and as Dan had said for those that sat in on his session, the developers have infinite reasons to ignore you. You know, the, uh, they, they have the features and functionalities, and they have the promise of a hotshot uh, VP, uh, business line VP. That is, that is kryptonite to any AppSec ask that you bring in the door. So if you can somehow nudge them and get them to do things that you want to do on their behalf, on, on your behalf, that's fantastic. And I think that for those that have seen uh, you know, uh, what Brad Arkin's done at, at, in some of his public presentations at Adobe, you know, getting them to this to become an issue that they do on their own, on your behalf, you know, leveraging the, the handful of AppSet guys that you have, that then you're starting to see what success is. Because, I mean, your five or six or seven AppSec people, if you have those, are not going to conquer the thousand developers that you have to influence. This is a, a leverage uh, uh, play here. So rewards help nudge people, help get their attention, and, and we're talking a thousand bucks here, two thousand bucks there, you know, throw out an iPad. Uh, and if you think that we're above that, look at all the seasoned, hardened AppSet guys that are walking around trick-or-treating at the vendor stands next door. I mean, we're, we're, we all do that. So uh, we all have nephews and nieces and, and children. Uh, so, so the point is, is that incentives matter. They will get people's attentions. The other thing is training programs must be tailored to be effective. Uh, again, the vast majority of, particularly in the larger companies, I didn't pull this out in this presentation, but if you look, if you look at how a training is being conducted in the respondents that were from those enterprise clients, those numbers even jump out at you more. So if you go to the 10,000 above enterprise, it's almost entirely e-learning uh, and le to a lesser degree classroom training. All those other things they don't care about because it doesn't scale. They, uh, so if those are the cornerstone are, are the, you know, the, the bread and butter of your AppSec training program. How do you leverage those? How do you use those in a way, uh, given the fact that consumption by definition is abysmal? And, and we'll say this to whomever. If you, if you buy from any of the vendors e-learning and throw it out there and send out a link, you're going to be disappointed because the developers will simply not, maybe one or two will open it up, but you have to have it as part of some program. If you just throw it out there, You'll, you'll find out really where you sit in the hierarchy of political power within your organization. Uh, so adding some of those newer things we talked about, the, the crowdsourcing, the, the social learning platforms, they're kind of, you know, the, particularly with the, uh, the, the developers that are below two years of, uh, those numbers, uh, they, we, we went back and looked at the numbers, the efficacy of training for some of those around social media is higher in, in the uh, below two years. So that, that bears some additional analysis too. I'd be willing to argue that uh, if you're you know, 25 or below and have two or three years of experience, you're probably not super excited about the e-learning uh, platform that got ruled out. You're probably more gonna learn it on the fly. Uh, and, and, and a lot of these kids, a lot of the developers, a lot of us you know, had formal education at one point, but they simply do not have it. You know, you're not, they don't have the opportunity to have it since. Uh, using those in, pulling those in, pulling current events in to uh, make it interesting, to bring a point, uh, uh, to make a point, I think the most successful companies are able to pull off of headlines and map that over to a particular uh, risk issue within their company and say, hey, hey we, you know, this happened at fillinthecompany.com and, and therefore here's what we can learn from it. Oh, by the way, you probably should go brush up on this and if you have a, uh, if you go take this five uh, uh, you know, question quiz, you'll be thrown in a, in, into a drawing for an iPad. Uh, th those, those, those things actually work, as, 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 believe it or not. So leveraging events is an important, important part. So I'm gonna wrap up, be, like, as I mentioned, because uh, I wanna have enough time for questions and answers here. The, that 56% number is the one you can take to the bank. I think that's important. I think there's a lot of other numbers that, are, that, that really jumped out at us, but that's one that, uh, given what we did last year, what our friends at Aspect did, that's, that's also very cool. You know, having a data-driven application security program is, is important. Now you can go in and say, here's our starting point, here's what we did, here's what others are doing. You have references, and honestly, if you go to CFOs, and if you go to business leaders, absent of numbers, you will be cut down at the knees. As I mentioned in my intro, I'm an MBA guy. Guess what you do in two years of MBA school? Numbers, numbers, numbers. Don't tell me, show me. Don't tell me, show me. I don't care what you think or perceive, show me the numbers. That's the way those guys think. That's the way CEOs and CFOs think. So if you come in saying we ought to do this, that's great. 
that even if it's PCI driven, they still want to see the ROI in the most sophisticated organizations. And again, tailor programs, throw in incentives, be creative, and admit the fact that you might actually be a marketing person in addition to being an AppSec person. And if you, if you come to that realization, it's okay. You don't have to tell anybody, uh, but it will serve you well in your efforts within the organization. So with that, uh, I will wrap up. And uh, for the record, uh, I've got this as part of a white paper we're putting out. So I'm looking for people that are willing to review the white paper. All the this is the tip of the iceberg. I had 45 minutes. Uh, it's, there's a ton of data. Would love your input. So if you're interested, you can mention on Twitter, DM me, email me, whatever way you, you want to do that. And with that, uh, I've got time for questions, a bit of time for questions and answers. Yes, sir. You say uh, effective pressure? Refresher. Refresher. Uh, uh, I, I think uh, what we see right now, and, and anecdotally, and plus with the, the data, is that there's, there's not a conscious effort to have any refresher data. Uh, nothing. I, I don't see that. And if you, again, if for those that are familiar with OpenSAM or BSAM or whatever, there, there is a higher level set of questions about is it repeatable? Do you measure it? Do you, you know, uh, we simply don't see that, that level of attainment, except in the, in the most uh, sophisticated organizations. What, what I would say is two things. Number one, if you, if you regurgitate the same content, um, that, that doesn't come across particularly well. Hey, you took this stuff a year ago, you're going to get to take it again. Like, yoo -hoo. What we see companies do particularly well is they'll take a subset of those questions, let's say five or six, and say, hey, again, throw in an iPad, throw in whatever, I watch, throw in something. Uh, you know, Samsung Galaxy, uh, and then if you get the following six correct, you're, you're, th you're thrown in for a, uh, you know, one of these, but also you don't have to go back and take the refresher test. So there's an incentive. You let them know when you take the first training, hey, we're going to do a pop quiz in November, later this year. We'll send out a, sub, a subset of these questions. If you pass them, God bless, you win a prize. If you don't, you get to take the training again. The other thing is the use of the events. I mentioned the current events. Those are particularly salient. And the best security guys are the ones that are able to take those events and in a non-chicken little way, in a non-FUD way, take those events and say, here's how it's relevant to us and here's how we should put some of those ideas to work in our training program. If you can do that in a measured and uh, straightforward way, you will be successful, more successful. Yes, sir. So that's our next, that's, that's the, the next level of analysis that we're doing. It's like taking those guys that identified and then going back. So the interesting, we, no, I'm going to get, like, like literally uh, for this presentation, that's one that we did not include, but I want to tease out. So the cool thing is we have the data, and we have the data from last year. And one thing that jumps out at us is like, holy crap, we could do a presentation on facets of that. And that, I'm glad we asked that SEOC question because I can map that a, across the other variables that we got. Uh, to some degree, we ran, a little bit ran out of time, so, but that's an area that I want to tease out, too. If you, set, you, if you were that 27% or whatever that said you had an SDLC, how did you fare in the other questions? That's, that, that did not make it in, just for uh, time concerns. Yes, sir. No. No, but that is another one that's interesting. That could be like a yes, no button question. Did you, in your undergraduate days, did you have any of these classes? And again, postgrad or anything. So uh, that is a great question. And that might be, you know, we, so one of the challenges we had when we rolled this out is we thought 15 was about the max. Above 15, we lose people. And everyone's gotten one of those customer sat deals that like after page two, you're like, I give up. You know, uh, they call it fatigue, or is it questionnaire fatigue or time fatigue? Uh, so that may be one we add, but like we're trying to figure out for 2015 what we ask. What, what, what we'll have to then do is nail down, is it like one lecture in one course? And, and because most of the classes that can say secure system design are 80% encryption theory and 20% secure dev theory. So that's our experience. And Dan and I both are on university boards of advisors. So uh, have done that. So that's 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 the sober reality. You may get people that overrepresent that, and who knows? Our experiences as an employer is we don't see that 
cause and effect. So, yes, sir. Uh, like I said, I gave examples of electronics. Uh, you know, uh, anything that's small. That first of all, you know, it doesn't have to be thousands of dollars. A trip to Cabo with your wife. You know, that's that. You know, this is trinkets and, and, and cool little uh, like an iWatch, three hundred bucks, four hundred bucks. Uh, a few of those. Uh, I mean, that, I, that sounds very tactical, uh, but I'm saying those things do work a little bit. Uh, to put it another way, the absence of any you will get tepid responses. I think that is something to take out. We said that last year in, in, in spades. If you have no incentives, you should expect miserable responses from your development team, unless they have the CIO with a nine millimeter at their forehead saying, do this. Absent of that, that imperative, you're not gonna get that, that consumption rate. Yes, sir. Yes, we have. Yes, and that, uh, that should be, and for the people that do open SAM or BSIM assessments, that should be a question. Uh, honestly, that's a great field questionnaire thing. Do you do this? And I've seen it, <coughs> as soon as it shows up in performance management, then it becomes real. Again, uh, now, now, not only are you a marketing person, but now you're a salesperson. Uh, and, I, and I think that is a top-down approach. It's probably difficult as an AppSec manager or somebody in the, but that's something you have to go uh, from the top down and say, we need to, because what they'll say is, uh, as a development VP, what do you want to give up? Like, like, I can't just continue to layer on more requirements. And so I think that's one that you have to make that business case. And maybe it's a modest business case. One thing I focused on last year, I'll just repeat here for everybody, the AppSec training is far more disruptive to the developers than awareness training is to uh, users. Because awareness training in typical is 15, 20 minutes, once a quarter, you don't care, you're doing it while you're on a conference call. Yep, 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 real easy. Yeah, don't click on links, yeah, yeah. Uh, most AppSec training, by definition, is typically at the very low end, a day or half a day, and typically two days for class instructor-led training. And if you look at the e-learning blocks of instruction, they're just longer. It's a harder problem. You know, not clicking on links is one thing, but like learning how to build code in a more secure way, it's a harder problem. Therefore, it's more disruptive. So it's a bigger ask. You have to get marshal a bit more political horsepower to get that done. It's a hard job. Sure. Yes, that too. I did not address that. That's actually uh, one thing that we didn't go down that path. That's a great point. One that we talked about but just didn't make it in. So for those that didn't hear, gamification. Uh, what one, that is an interesting area of discussion. Uh, I think that if I were a sophisticated person in this world, I would use e-learning and instructor-led training as kind of the, the broad building blocks, but figure out how to use gamification to make it interesting. You know, hey, we're gonna do this, but we're gonna put pit these two teams against these two teams in October, <coughs> and you know, we're gonna buy all the guys pizza who win or something like that. Then, then it's like, okay, maybe I'll pay attention slightly more. But I think gamification is cool. I think it's still early stage and, uh, and that's where a lot of folks are going. The, what we heard in this study is it's not the main way uh, companies are teaching developers uh, secure development concepts. Yes, sir. Yeah. 